Here we go. Good job, All right. That thanks. Well, welcome to our July artist talk. I can't believe it's July already. Um, this is an artist talk series that Alchemy gets to do in conjunction with the IMA, which is really cool and special that we get to do this together in this great multi-use space. And we we often have visiting artists who are part of our visiting artist program present in partnership with a local artist. But this month, we are very excited to have two extremely well-known and accomplished local artists presenting together. So it's kind of a double headliner situation, which is very exciting. Um, so we're going to be starting off with Alicia Merrick, um, who is the owner of Fern, as well as so many other things. And she's going to just come right in and get us going. Thank you so much to everybody who's here and to everybody who's joining us via Zoom. Okay. Ooh, all right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me, Glenn. So sweet. Um, and yeah, it's just lovely to be in this space and to be um ooh, I'm gonna touch going by itself. Is it going by itself? Okay. Um yeah, to just be invited to um talk about my work. And I have sort of decided to do like a little bit of a timeline, um, but it's it's not in chronological order. It's gonna be sort of um now and then going back and then coming back to now, just so you have a little backstory to reference. But obviously um, this sweet little picture, I'm probably in kindergarten in this one. And um, to this day, I really, really love to color. And um, coloring is like one of the most relaxing things I find that I can do because I don't have to think about what I'm making. I'm just coloring between the lines. Um, and I'm also not going to talk about each piece as I go. I'm going to just talk about myself and my work and flip through these. And then if you have questions about any of the pieces, feel free to ask me. Um, to begin, I guess I'm just feeling a lot of gratitude in general for the place that I am as an artist, um, because only I know how far I've come and it's leaps and bounds um and it's also funny to me how you cannot know that a place exists and then all of a sudden you're a 10-year resident of a place that you didn't know existed before and that's how I feel about this island um moved here like 11 years ago came to visit because my husband um had a job offer and I was really lucky enough to, um, he said, hey, take my car for the day. And there was a studio nearby in the place that he was renting. And it happened to be Paula West Studio. Mm -hmm. And so I'm visiting this amazing island and I show up at this artist studio. And, you know, I mean, any of you that have been to her space or seen her work or met her, I mean, it's just, it was just this like, very powerful experience for me to be like she's an artist and she's creating from her home and this is amazing and um very inspiring to me I didn't plan to get emotional um <clears throat> anyway then I moved here <laughs> um and I'm really big on like daydreaming like it's a huge part of kind of how I get from one place to another with my work and with my creative life and with my personal life. And um, I don't always know how I'm going to get from one place to another, but that's kind of how I roll. So I set out to um, create sort of a, a dreamy life for myself, kind of that I aspired to be like Paula <laughs> in a certain creative way. Um, and this island is like so inspiring and it's got so many creative people and it's like the nature and the beauty of it. I mean, it's just, it's so, it's overwhelming at points, um, but it gives me a lot of reasons to keep going and the support of the islanders really humble me 
constantly, uh, more so now than ever. Um, and when I moved here, I didn't have a studio. I didn't have a job. Um, we scraped together a place to live. And so I like painted on a little drafting table and I learned of a, um, there was a woman in our neighborhood where we ended up renting and she had a glass kiln that she let me use for enameling because that is my like primary medium. Um, and then I ended up renting a space uh, at the local business center and I bought myself a kiln. And so that was kind of the jumping off point for having like somewhere that I could make work all the time, um, which was really important. And I intended it for it to be like a, um, a studio where people would come and shop and that never really happened. So I kind of grappled with the fact that I just would have to sell my work outside of that space and then just have that be where I was making the actual work. Um, and while I was doing all of that, I was working a lot of random jobs. Um, I've always until recently worked a lot of random jobs. Um, the list is very long of things that I did that were not art. And I always had the art thing going on on the side. Um, and the more I did that, kind of the more I started to resent all the other jobs. Um, and the sadder I got and the more stifled I felt. And so, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not clicking through these. Um, so the last one was watercolor. This one is enamel on copper. And I'm referencing my cards here. Um, pretty soon there's going to be a slide of my first year at Roche Harbor, which um, here it is. Yeah. Um, this is Paula and I's booth at Roche Harbor. And it was my first year there. I ended up doing it for five years. Um, and she joined me for the first one. And it was so great because look how great our work went together. Like, obviously hers has shifted a little bit, but like, the colors, the shapes, the the minimal kind of aesthetic that we both share um, just really lent itself to that space. Um, so yeah, I did the Serena Business Park for my studio for five years, um, worked Roche Harbor, and, and then finally in 2018 had my own home studio, which was a thing, right? Because like got the house, got the studio, and it's honestly, it's the best studio I've ever had the privilege of working in. So I feel amazed every time I go down there. Um, and in like 20, 2019, I just sort of had this weird epiphany. Um, I had been slowly quitting. I quit my landscaping job in like 2017, maybe. Um, I think I quit waiting tables at Backdoor Kitchen in 2018. Um, and then by 2019, I, I was doing like some pop-ups and realizing that I wanted to have more exposure than just the farmer's markets on Saturdays and more control over the space that I could curate. Um, this work is acrylic on paper. Glenn's going to recognize all these. Um, and, um, so basically, I just decided to quit all of my jobs and go for it. Um, this was a series of three. Then I started making, I'm going to be all over the place. It's just how it's going to go. But um, I'm a lover of textiles and color and pattern and nature. And so this painting is my favorite color. It's green. Um, and then I decided I wanted to make some of my paintings into textiles in the easiest way that I could see to do that with scarves. So this one um, is a silk and cotton blend. I have them for sale on my website. They're super scrumptious and soft. And it took me a bit to find um, a company that would do like natural fibers because I didn't want any kind of like polyester synthetic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing is very important to me. And then this is the third in that series. 
And these three were all painted in a class that I took here on the island with Marsha McAllister. And I had previously never painted in this fashion before. And I really surprised myself. And this was around the time where I kind of for once, like maybe the last five, six years or something, I finally have started to actually be proud of my work. So that sounds crazy knowing that I've been making work my whole life, but that's kind of how it is. Um, I just was like, wow, I made that. Um, and then I did a couple of moths that were in the same series. Over on the table, there's um, some objects that I brought that are inspiring to me. And there's a couple of moths there um, and some little seeds and pods and just uh, natural objects that I pick up on hikes and whatnot, which, uh, which always get incorporated into my work. Um, I feel like I haven't said already that I, um, that I was having a little bit of trouble, like sort of taking myself seriously because I was doing all the other things. But, but when I did make the shift, it was pretty much like, um, it was very immediate. Like I couldn't go back and also, um, very scary, I guess. Um, uh, and um, I might want to skip around a little bit more because I feel like I should go backwards now. So um, when I was a kid, yes, I loved coloring. And then I like in junior high and high school, I started getting, I don't know if they were like student of the month awards or whatever they were, but they were the art awards that you would get and we would have to go to the thing and st I'd stand up and I'd get the little piece of paper and I was so excited about it um mm -hmm. and um in high school I actually um would go half of the day to the other high school that we had in town and I would take commercial art which is basically graphic design um so the entire time I was growing up I was gearing up for illustration and graphic design um which is why I still have like work going on in all different mediums because I thought I was going to major in that in art school and then I got there and I took an elective in enameling and basically fell in love with the whole like shiny glass kiln thing um and it was a big surprise to me uh, and I also realized, uh, it's funny now, because I have, I've had to teach myself a lot of things on the computer, but this was like the 90s, and I realized that I was going to have to work on a computer if I wanted to do graphic design, and I was so against it that I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to major in that, forget it. Um, kind of unavoidable at this point, which was funny. Um, but um, another thing that happened, like in art, school and stuff is when I was in high school I was the only student that went to college for art in my graduating class mm -hmm. I was the top of my class and then I got to art school and I realized that I was at the bottom because I went from getting straight A's to getting C's and D's and everyone like all of my peers in college had taken figure drawing and they had taken perspective and they had taken all these classes that I I was like completely unaware of so I was super behind and it was getting the lower grades and fi figuring that out was like looking back was sort of like this huge blow to like my um my creative ego maybe because it has I mean I'm still like working out of it I'm still like trying to find the confidence all the time and aspiring to um, to really take myself seriously and consider myself a real artist. And I mean, stuff like this helps, thank you. Um, uh, so I appreciate that, but but like, I don't know when when you're just, when you have that in you and you don't know, like I didn't have anyone in my life that was creative that I could 
aspire to. I didn't, I didn't have like role models close to me that I didn't even know to aspire to anything, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so, um, moving here was like this huge shift in everything for me. And it's, it's been an eye-opening experience. It's been a huge, um, learning experience. I'm very humbled. Um, when I decided in 2019 to kind of jump in, I wanted to open my own store in town. It's like a gallery boutique. Um, and so I made a business plan and pined and I got this little shop. Um, it's a tiny little thing and it's in town and I love it. Um, and I was set to open March 16th of 2020 and I got there and I ripped the paper off the windows and I was like where are all the cars <laughs> and I texted my friend who has a shop on Spring Street and I said what is going on she said everybody's going home so that was bad timing um but I when I was able, I think the ban lifted the end of May or June or something, I was able to open my store. And so I spent the first, what, two and a half years of it, like wearing a mask and, you know, being afraid and having people just come in and everything was just very weird. And I mean, it, obviously it gradually lifted, but it was, it was just a very interesting time to, to start that um, that endeavor. Um, this is a piece that is glass on copper, glass enamel on copper, and it's actually the top, the middle, and then all the pieces at the bottom are separate, and I enameled them separately and then reassembled them um, into this frame. Same with this one. And this one was really special. Um, I had etched the sky, so it had like a velvety finish on top. Um, how am I doing on time, Glenn? You're great. Okay. You're at, you've been going 20 minutes. Okay. So you're about yeah. halfway through. Cool. So. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, little fern dishes. Yeah. Can you explain what the enamel Absolutely. Is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is. Um, so basically I take clean copper, clean, shiny copper. You want to get all the oils off of it. Um, and the enamel itself is like pre-ground, pre-colored glass, um, little powder jars. Um, and sometimes the color in the jar fires the same way onto the stuff most of the time, actually. But sometimes it's a little bit different, unlike regular ceramic glazes. Um, the kiln is different from a ceramic kiln, and the firing is much quicker. Um, I like to refer to my kiln as, as more of an easy bake oven, which, because you just put it in for a very short time and then you take it out and um, it's none of the cone firing in the overnight business. Um, but anyway, I, I mostly sift my enamel on um, and the, so like for instance, on let's say the middle teal bowl here, um, I would fire a sifted layer of the teal on first, and when it gets shiny in the kiln, um, pull it out, let it cool, and then I hand draw each um, each drawing on these. So I have a marker. There's my studio. Oh, there's my cute little kiln. Um, see what I mean about the easy bake oven? Yeah. Um, and. Um, Anyway, I draw with a marker the drawing and then I sift on a, you know, an accent color, something that is going to really stand out from the base color, fire that into. So the whole thing is fired. It's not going to scratch off. Does it stick to the marker? It sticks only where the marker is. It's a magical, magical thing that a friend of mine taught me. Yeah. After college. So that's pretty fun. And then in this picture, you can see behind me the jars of enamel um, and everything. And the firing is about 1,500 degrees. Um, and it's a couple minutes. I mean, two or three minutes. If it's a larger piece, it's going to take longer. Um, and normally, like, one firing per color um, 
I mean, it gets a little bit faster if you're doing multiple like tiny things because you can put more pieces in. But generally, I'm doing like only one thing at a time. Um, you have to wait till the kiln is like, does the kiln have like a heating up period? Like, yeah. Off? Is it like, yeah. But it's like at top temperature for a couple of minutes or so. I have it um, set at a program so that it, it comes up to 1500 and it stays there for five hours so that I can, I mean, that's about as long as I'm in the studio. Sometimes I reset it and restart it while I'm in there to work longer. But um, yeah, I mean, it. Oh, when you open the door, in, when you yeah. open the door, it drops, oh. it drops to like 13 something or 14 something. Oh. And then you, you, when it's in there, it's going to be coming back up. And when it's around 1500 again, I kind of peek in, I have little goggles and, and take the thing out at like 1500 yeah degrees. yeah okay. yeah and it's yeah it's it's hot in there it's yeah. hot that's that's the green goggles that I wear um and I have like a little I have like a little glove and yeah I just pull it out with the little the little thing that's so cool. um um very yeah sweet little beats these are my best selling like I made all my a lot of my paintings and illustrations I make into cards and stickers and stuff um, to give to sell at the shop. And this is my favorite food one by far. And this one I was inspired because I was working at the farmer's market and I was, um, you know, the food co-op had purchased some to sell. So that was, that was kind of a fun thing, but these are my cards. Um, I have cards in all of my paintings and drawings, but what I do want to say is that I took the time when I was pulling images for this talk, um, I went through this giant manila folder that I've had since college that has stuff from my whole life in it. And I'm terrible because I have not stored things properly. So I couldn't show a lot of them because they were, you know, water damage or graphite got on stuff it wasn't supposed to, but what really stood out to me um, looking at the entire body of work was just how the line quality is the same, the, um, the style is the same, the subject matter, even when I was younger, was all very naturey and like plants and birds and moths and bugs and um, and stuff. So that was just really special to kind of see, um, you know, the whole kind of timeline of it. This ribbon, this isn't normally something I would do, um, but I had gotten some ribbon for my wedding. Um, it was hand dyed silk from a friend of mine here on the island. And I just had, you know, a length, I don't know how long of it. And so I started cutting it and making pieces um, and suspended it from that. And I just really loved the way this one came out. Um, and this example, um, obviously I love ferns. I named my shop Fern. Um, I put ferns in all my work, uh, but this is a good example of that marker and the firings. Cause this is like a three firing thing here so that you can see that. Um, and then what I really love the most of everything is flowers. And so I am leaning into a big flower um, series, a big flower chunk of my life here. And again, I made that one into uh, a scarf. That one is linen. Um, and cotton. And I mean, I like to do a, as many different things as I can with these. And I, this is the house, this is a house number. Um, I also do separate house numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had this dream, you know, cause you see those like old French ones with the blue and white and they're so cool, but they're actually harder for me to make than that. So, mm -hmm. um, never got around to doing them like in production. But speaking of production, this is the kind of thing, I think this was a post that I did on Instagram that was like, this is the most 
enameling I've ever done in one day. Like this was a marathon enamel day. Um, it's a lot of production. Um, and uh, I used to hand cut all of my shapes and pieces. And then I, um, I kind of wrecked my wrist. I should have showed you the, um, in the slide with my kiln and everything in my studio, the size of the blade that you need to cut this stuff with, like, is so tiny. It's like as thin as this paper, like the edge. And so anyways, I started getting smart and I have been getting the more elaborate shapes laser cut, which has really saved my wrist and um, been a lifesaver in high season here on the island when people are buying things faster than I can make them. Um, this is the archipelago necklace. So gold leaf um, and enamel on one side and then the other side, the back sides are always gonna be a contrasting solid color. So if you, I kind of call it the fancy casual one. So um, anyway, the way the, the gold organically breaks up in the kiln just really reminds me of the islands. Um, in a very abstract way, obviously, but. Do you apply the gold, it's solid, or do you apply it kind of like that? Um, does it in more? Well, I sort of apply it like that, but okay. but it does, it pulls, a, it moves a little bit mm -hmm. when you fire it, yeah. Um, is that the next one? Yeah, okay. Um, just some fun uh, baubles, there's, there's not a lot of work, like I was saying, that just gets me excited. And I don't know why I love these so much, but they're just like, when I wear them, I, sh I almost wore them today. I'm wearing some tubes instead, but they just feel like gumballs. I mean, they're, they're very kind of heavy and they, you know, I don't know. I like the weight of them and I've always loved the weight of jewelry on the body and the fact that um, the way that it like your heat of your body transfers onto the jewelry. I don't know. It's kind of a thing. How do you enamel a sphere? It's hard. <laughs> so um, I had to buy a special, it's a trivet, like a mesh screen that is U-shaped. Okay. Uh -huh. And then these steel rods that you suspend the bead on. Mm -hmm. And then I, I put like a, um, it's called clear fire. It's like a cellulose substance. Um, it's a little bit sticky uh, and you put that on the bead and then you sift the powder on mm -hmm. and it sticks. But I have to do probably usually about three firings, even if it's just this kind of bead to get to get it to cover the surface mm -hmm. because it's it doesn't want to coat all the sides and stay on well. Yeah, it seems like very challenging. It is, yeah. The round stuff is especially hard. This is the one I'm wearing, which is one of my favorites because I'm in like a big rainbow flower phase. Um, my work is, it's pretty exciting when people come in and they're like, it's so happy in here. It is, I really love that. Um, these are hand cut sterling silver. They're called Mountain Sunrise. Originally, I had them as two separate pair of earrings. So one with two mountains and one with two sunrise. And then one of the first people that bought a pair, they wanted to mix them together. And so from then on, they became the Mountain Sunrise earrings. Um, and that's just a patina on the silver. And then I engrave into it the pattern for the landscape. Um, this is, yeah, called seed and flower. These are all individually hand cut pieces of copper enameled back and front and then, um, joined together with little tiny pieces of a brass tube and steel jump rings. Um, the lovely Mara is modeling at the beach here for me. This one is the land and sea. It's the same sort of idea. My favorite part about it is the water. Mm -hmm. um, just because I hadn't done anything with the brushwork before um, and the enamel together. And I like the way that came out. 
um, this one, I took another class here on the island with Marsha McAllister in the very, very beginning of 2020. And this was one of my favorite pieces that I made at the end of that course. And it's called The Cusp of Spring. Um, just my favorite colors, my favorite patterns all coming together. Um, probably most of you have been to my shop or know of my shop, but this is my dreamy little um, shop that has taught me a ton about myself, about business, um, just, I don't know, marketing and purchasing. And um, it's pushed me to, I mean, I have an employee on payroll and I have a bookkeeper and I have all this stuff that was just really big and scary before, but is now like feels pretty normal. And um, I just, the reason I love having it so much, oh, well, there's a couple, but it's basically a showcase of all of my work. Um, so it feels like a little gallery show all the time. I get to speak with people about my work and, and it's so colorful that when they come in, they really, they just express joy and happiness, which is why I make the things. Mm -hmm. Um, also from early 2020, um, the piece that inspired this, the first one is actually on the easel over there. Um, it's abstract ferns that are just kind of squished together in the center. And I, I love the way that like the tension that it brings and the crazy colors, the way they mess with your eyes. Um, just little tidbits of stickers from the shop. Um, this is me utilizing owl drawings in every sort of way that I possibly can. Um, this series, uh, I try to use all the scraps from my work. So this, the, some of them are the centers of other pieces of things that I've gotten laser cut. And then I have the cutter send the other shapes. So these are the centers of other things. Um, and it's hard to see, but maybe at the bottom of the image, you can see how it's a little bit grainy. If you under fire enamel, um, it gets sort of an orange peel sort of texture to it, which is really lovely. And the reverse side of that is all green. It's all one color. Um, I'm very into flowers. Mm -hmm. I should probably just keep saying it, but um, this is hand cut sterling. Love them. Only made the one pair and recently made one other, so. Um, I felt like, well, when I was in school, when I was doing commercial art, there was a lot of stuff with fonts and with, um, commercial, yeah, kind of like magazine layouts and all this stuff. So I've always really loved doing lettering. Um, and I made this and it was in the museum show a couple years ago. Um, and I planned on taking it to the shop to sell and it was in my car and I couldn't do it. So I took it home. And I put it at the end of my hallway on a bubblegum pink wall. And I've never painted anything pink in my life. So that was also a new experience. <laughs> it looks great, though. And I can see it when I'm, like, chopping vegetables and cooking. Um, having a shop kind of lends itself to needing window displays. And it takes a lot for me to think about what to put up there and it feels like a lot of pressure sometimes and it takes a long time because I always want to make them and not buy them um but one day I was like oh I'm just gonna get cards like a big poster board and I'm gonna start doing a thing and so it turned into a hand cut like hand colored um thing for my shop and it just was the sweetest thing and it made me so happy that I never wanted to take it down but I did <laughs> um and this painting is actually over there as well because this is the direction I'm going super fun um there's an old painting underneath this which you can see like in the petals of this one and then over there too where that blue one is but I've also started just if I don't like a painting I'm just gonna paint over it and make something that I like more um gift wrap you guys what <laughs> all my owls with my favorite color so cute 
that was kind of dreamy. Um, this is my biggest painting I've ever done. I think it's three feet um, square. Inspired by an artist friend of mine who passed away this year. Um, and she had this amazing garden in Maine. And um, she just was, she was very inspiring. Um, she had a fearlessness about the way she created work and just diligently just always making 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 and it was amazing to see um to see all the stuff that she made um this is the latest painting I did with the intention of making it into a sticker for my shop um which is as far as I've gotten with it but it's just a fun practice to do the watercolor to do the um the lettering again and to just kind of play with things. Um, that might be my last one, nope. This is the, um, basically the flower thing that I did with the poster board turned into jewelry form. So this is sheet copper, and this is the beginning of my spring collection, um, which just launched in June right at the solstice um so I just cut every single piece out and then I'm wearing right now I'm wearing the um the tulips which are so pretty um and yeah just playing around with the shapes and the colors and trying new things the the color that is inside the red and the blue on the two sides um that's a new technique I've never done before with um overglaze enamels mm -hmm. so um I'm looking forward to exploring that more um it looks like that is it I'm gonna put it on there and I'm just gonna make sure that I didn't miss anything mm -hmm. um yeah I mean I think I think what it boils down to is just me being more comfortable in my skin and me being um, more confident and not as like not taking taking myself more seriously as an artist, but not feeling the need to make every single thing that I make perfect um, because that is a really um, it's just a really bad way for I think any creative person to try to move forward. Um, and I'm really proud of where I am and I'm proud of how refined my work is getting and the fact that um, more things that I make now I really really like whereas before I hardly ever made anything I liked and so I'm excited to see kind of where it goes because I feel like I'm I'm on the edge of the some good stuff. Yeah. Thank you for listening. We have about five minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask questions. I'm curious about like when you actually decided to quit all the things and jump in, mm -hmm. like was there was it just like wearing on you over time until you finally made the call or was it like an event that like pushed you over the edge? Yeah. Um, well, there had been, there had been different points kind of along the way, um, like obvious uh, signs, I guess, to me. I remember walking one time into the farmer's market, which I, I mean, I did so many times and I had gone and I had set up my booth and I had maybe gone to the restroom or done something and walked back and saw my booth with fresh eyes and been like, I hate everything. I'm rebranding. <laughs> like, and I immediately bought new tape, like made new uh, table skirts, made a new logo, like new business name, all the things. And it sort of happened that way. I mean, it was definitely wearing on me for a long time, but I think I just got to the point where I was like, if I'm not doing it now, I'm not doing it. And so I just, I just jumped in, but it was definitely scary and, um, and stuff for sure. Yeah. Yep. 
-hmm. more questions thank you alicia thank so you well cool. i'm gonna pause the recording and then if people want to just like take a minute break we're gonna get started with paula all right we are back after a light break and we are very excited to welcome paula west and learn about her journey as a ceramics artist and hear about some of that background um and other other processes that she's done as well, or whatever she has to share. Um, thank you so much for attending this artist talk. We're so, so grateful to have these two amazing island artists joining us tonight. It's such a treat. Paula Great West. Thank <laughs> Thanks, John. Really happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. This is my first artist talk, just so you know. Although I talk a lot when people come to my studio. So it's just a little bit of a different format. Um, so my name is Paula West. I'm a studio potter. Um, I've been um, focused on functional pottery pretty much my whole, since beginnings in college. Um, I've had um, a recent transition in my work, which is what I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna give you a little background of where I was, where I was, and mostly focus on what my transition to my new body of work um, has been for me, because that's what I'm most excited about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, um, we set, I set up my studio in 1993 um, and began working um, with a porcelain clay, uh, a, a black slip, and a clear glaze, simple palette. Um, the black and white was very graphic, which I was drawn to. Um, I wanted to simplify things and not get too uh, spread out with um, different glazes and whatnot. I mean, it's such a wide variety of uh, ceramics. You can do different clay, different glazes, different firing temperatures. Um, and I had an electric kiln to work with, um, which was a little different than what I had done in college, which was high fire reduction. So I had to figure out a, a voice and a body of work um, that worked with my electric kiln. So um, these are some earlier images of some carved scr scorfito pieces that I did. Um, and I'll just kind of take you through uh, these. And how do I get? No. Yeah. yeah. Also, my computer has been a little bit. It'll just start going sleepy. really fast. Yeah, it's probably gonna like go yes. to like three slides. It's been a little bit sleepy. Anyway, well, okay. Okay, wait. Should I stop the share? Sorry, okay. technical difficulties. Let's see. We're what stop I... the share, and then we're going to restart the share. Okay. My computer is just a sweet little old baby it needs a little nurturing yeah um so let's yes, see what was okay, i gonna do go. so anyway i uh okay there we go there we go sweet okay so um yeah uh i started work with porcelain because i just love the texture of it smooth it's like cream cheese um it's very white and so things really pop on the on the clay um and also you know with the graphic work it just yeah it's just very satisfying um uh let's see there's a few pieces um so i was doing i was doing black and white for a long time get comfortable with it um and then i started bringing in uh some color commercial underglazes just to because they popped really nicely too on the porcelain um yeah uh, interesting so these guys are like wax resist with black slip and then just a little of underglaze um this is like a big bowl uh it's upright so you don't really get the sense of that but anyway um let's see what else we got yeah there's another scraffito piece big platter that i worked on um yeah fun trying to have fun um yeah and so these and a lot of these images um like this work is a little more recent um i set up we set up the studio in 93 and i didn't really dig in full time until maybe 2005 um in that um, in that time, there was other work. There was a couple babies. Um, there was other things. So I worked when I could. Um, 
but in 2005, once um, I quit my other jobs, my kids were a little older, I could really dive into my work and work consistently at a consistent pace. And suddenly it was, um, I could see the changes in my work. I could see the focus that was consistent, like day to day. I didn't have to like come back to the studio after four days and things were dry. What was I working on? Because, you know, if you're not working day to day, you lose that rhythm and that flow, especially with clay, because clay dries out. Um, so a lot, a lot of these images are from like 2005 on. Um, and then I started to get into a little bit of the um, drawing with Mishima, little doodles, just trying to have fun. Um, another thing that I'm thinking of with this work is when I was in college, I did a lot of uh, brown, blue, gla drippy glazes. That was a thing in you know the early 80s. Um, so when I started to kind of find my voice, what do I want to do? I was like, I'm never doing brown and I'm never doing blue again. I just was like, so I sort of went opposite. Um, and yeah, that was kind of interesting. But um, yeah, so here's some of the, my newer work in the past few years. Um, Mishima with, um, with carved little uh, flowers and drawings and um, always sort of bringing in the black and white because I always seem to come back to that. Yes. Can you explain what Mishima is? Mishima is a, is a, where you um you incise into the clay when it's sort of leather hard. You use a needle tool or you use a sharp. Um, I use a scalpel sometimes, um, and you you can incise lines in and you fill it with like a opposite color under glaze, um, and then you kind of scrape it off once, you know, to get that fine fine line. <clears throat> There's some other pieces of bright my bright underglazes and a little bit of the wax resist little little shapes um yeah so with the wax resist you're kind of made you're putting wax on around the outside yeah that's exactly I would usually draw a shape or if it was a bowl shape like on this bowl um the the wax resist is what you see is white basically and then you lay in the underglaze um the black so you're basically, you're, you're trying to keep the, I was trying to keep the color of the white clay with the wax. And then wherever I didn't put the wax was where the color went. Um, and then these little guys were all drawn with a little needle tool and, and incised and in color added after. Kind of crazy piece. <laughs> yeah, and then there's a little more of my flowers and sgraffito, just whimsy. Um, yeah. And the functional work, uh, I've always made functional work or vessels, and I've always loved the idea of people using my work, practical aspect of it, but also the connections that you get with people when you make something. I've always enjoyed using handmade objects. Um, and so I've tried to do some sculpture a little bit, but I always come back to function vessels, even if it's just a big, uh, big huge pet vessel it's just always I don't know I never could really you know get away from it for that reason but um these guys are scraffito which is you you um you lay in a big field of color like the green or the red and then you just you you carve away to the clay underneath um so you get a little bit of texture you don't really see that in the images but um yeah Another big platter that's graffito carved. Um, pattern is really fun. Really, it's kind of mesmerizing. You get into a rhythm and you lose yourself in it, you know? And it's it's pretty late. This this kind of work with the graffito is pretty labor intensive. Um, you know, it, it, a big platter like this takes you a while to carve all that, all that underglaze away. Um, and I was getting to the point where it was just getting to be too labor intensive. And I wanted to get into some other kind of work that was a little more um, um, quicker and spontaneous. Um, maybe just not so much time, you know. Um, this was a carved piece that I did. Um, it was just carved and incised and then the, the glaze that I put on it um, cooled. So it really, really popped in that piece. Um, and then recently I started to use some other uh, red stoneware, which, and poured overlapped glazes. Um, just to something opposite from the white porcelain, a little earthier. Um, yeah, there's another one from that er that uh, red stoneware and just poured glazes. Um, 
And then I started about, uh, I don't know, several years ago, I took a, a, a workshop uh, and did some high fire soda firing and I got really excited about it. Um, and I thought someday I want to do that again. I want to build a kiln. I want to somehow get a kiln um, similar to what I had done in college. It always felt like the electric kiln was kind of cheating. It was like you program it and it, you know, and, and it fires and it, you know what I mean? I was like, cause I learned with the reduction in the flame and everything. And I thought someday maybe I'll get back to it. Um, so the time was right. Um, and in 2020, um, we finally, you know, decided that we could build a kiln. I say we, because my husband, Joe, I couldn't have done it without him, obviously. Um, so yeah, it was interesting because 2020, we got these pallets of brick, everything delivered, and then everything shut down, which was wonderful because then we had time to actually work on the kiln. So it, it was kind of uh, a good time to take on the new project. Um, so that's, so my kiln, and then that's with the door bricked up. Um, so what I'm, what my transition to this new work is, what you'll see is very, very different. Um, um, soda firing is a, is a atmospheric firing where you spray a solution of soda ash into the kiln and it vaporizes and it glazes the pots. Um, unlike dipping a pot into a liquid glaze, putting it in the kiln and it melts on the piece. So you're getting very, uh, uh, varied effects or your uneven effects, you're getting very directional glazing. Um, the the sodium sodium carbonate in the in the soda ash interacts with the silica and the alumina in the clay and it forms a glaze. Um, and I have this little video, I hope it comes up. This is a soda, this is spraying the soda at 2300 degrees. <laughs> So it's in a pressurized like a uh, cement garden sprayer. Um, and it's at the- Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's very loud too, because the burners are big and very loud. So you go around the kiln and you spray um, in all the ports where you want to spray. Uh, you do that for like an hour, an hour and a half, depending on, excuse me, depending on how much uh, glaze buildup you want on your pots. You can have a very thin layer. You can have really drippy, thick, um, it all depends on what aesthetic you're looking for, right? Um, let's see. So yeah, so that's at 2300 degrees when you're close to being to your top temperature. Mm -hmm. um, and then the flames all coming out of the kiln because you have the atmosphere reduced and it's coming out everywhere looking for oxygen. So it's very exciting and very hot um, and very loud because the burn burners are very loud. Um, so you spray, you, you go around and you spray and then one way to indicate how much glaze buildup you have is to pull these um, draw rings out of the kiln after you spray for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and these little rings are just made of clay and you pull them out um, and you look at them and see how much glaze buildup there is. And then over time you can say, oh, I think I'll spray another few rounds or um, maybe we're done. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> You, you do about five, uh, five, five rings in the total in the firing. Um, and each one that you pull out after you spray and spray, you, you can, you notice significantly the glaze pulled up and I meant to bring them tonight, but I forgot. So if you come to my studio, you can see them though. Right. Um, so yeah, so, um, everything has to get wadded. Um, those little round, uh, wads of clay on the bottom. Um, otherwise, things will stick to the shelf because you have the vapors going around the count, uh, around the pieces and under and over the top. Um, so that's you know it's a little bit you know labor intensive, but um, you get some really interesting uh, 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 decorative effects from them also, which is kind of cool. So this was my mo one of my most recent firings. The image on the left is the stack before firing. And then the image on the right is um, after the firing before I unloaded it. So this is, you actually see the difference in each piece. Um, and you can see the little draw rings here that are sitting that I pull out. Um, the cone packs are there. Um, it's kind of cool how you can see the difference of before and after. Do you ever knock over your rings trying to? Yeah, I've dropped them. I've yeah, dropped them. Like pull, like a hit, uh, hit coming out, and they fall. Luckily, I haven't had any fall on top of a piece yet. Yeah. They just fall to the floor, which is great. Yeah. You know, but yes. What's that? I've got it on video. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. 
I know. Um, so one of the ways you can affect what your work looks like in a soda kiln is um, how you stack the pieces on the shelves, how close they are together, how the heights are different things. So you want to allow space for the vapors to move around. Um, you spray into the side ports over where the flame's coming in. So um, you want to have room for the vapors to get pulled through and move and then it goes down and up the chimney. So um, that's one of the things that I'm learning is um, giving things some space, but also at the same time placing some pieces really close together because they will resist the soda, they will resist the vapors and you'll get some kind of cool, um, cool marks. That's kind of a, just a close up of um, one of the shelves. You can see like, you can see how the, the soda pools on your shelves. Um, some of the little drips are dripping off it as well. Um, Do you have to grind all that off? Well, uh, these shelves I don't, but typically it depends on what kind of shelves you have, you do. These are uh, fancy schmancy shelves that I bought and I scrape them with just like a metal scraper. Oh, wow. So it's a lot less labor, That's cool. um, which, you know, that was one factor. Seems you know. very worth it. It is, yeah. I mean, maybe when I was, if I was 20, I would have done that, but now that I'm... My back's been feeling it, right? So, um, so yeah, these are real, th those are great. They're also very light, and they're not supposed to warp, which is kind of nice. Um, Can I ask a question? About yeah. How are you? So, are you still applying underglaze? So that was my next okay. thing is what I was going to say. So you don't need to glaze the outsides of your pots. A glaze will form on your pots just from the sodium carbonate and um, the reaction with the clay. You can put slips for color. You can actually put glaze like that. Um, turquoise color is is a turquoise or rebay glaze. So you can glaze your pots also. Um, and you have to glaze the insides because the vapors don't go down in. They go around and over and under, but not in inside. So you do liner glazes on the inside and um, slips for color. Like, like uh, I'll, show, I'll give you an example. So the picture on the right um, has a titanium slip. And you can see how it reacts where it's green, where a lot of the soda hit. You can also see sort of the um, the way the soda got pulled because of the form. So, you, so you're thinking about form is going to affect what kind of um, pattern movement you get, and, and de you know decorative effects on the piece. Um, and you can kind of see, like you can see where all the soda hit on on the uh, right side of this piece, and then it kind of dissipated around. And, and this has a, a slip on it also. Um, and then this butter box just has um, those dots are a titanium slip, but the rest is just was just the raw clay. Um, that firing came out really white. I didn't get a lot of browns in that. Um, these pieces are uh, underglaze transfers that I commercially bought and applied. So they're kind of fun. What I like about this is that, um, and also with the soda kiln, is things uh, are very varied and imperfect, which is really nice after the other work that I was doing, you know, that was very much planned, fine, carved, like very defined lines. Um, so this is really, really fun um, to kind of move into this kind of work. These pieces, I was trying to take uh, some of my flowers from my past work and apply them to the to these pieces. Um, it's interesting, it's different, but um, Kind of fun and then and then this guy sometimes you can get a lot of iridescence um another way and so there's a few things that affect you know what what your what your pieces will look like and one really important factor is cooling down the kiln um you can you can shut it off at 2350 degrees and you can crash cool it by opening everything up like the door the people some people crack their doors if they have them on a you know, a hinge um, and just do this crash cool really quick. That, that can give you like this iridescence and bright. Some people reduce it, they shut it all down and then just keep firing it down. So that's when real color happens is like firing down as much as the firing up. Some people will fire down in reduction for eight hours after their firing is done. So it's, um, it's interesting because I saw a, a man came to visit me to my studio and he was a wood fire potter and he showed me some pictures of his work and there was so much color and depth and I said how did you get that and he said it's in the kiln for a long time and it fires down for a long time and I thought that that was really interesting um, because I've seen that with my work like with my my firings are about 12 14 hours 
you know, and I don't really do a long cool down. I, I, I just, I pretty much shut, shut it down, do a little soak. But um, I thought that was interesting, just that idea of the longer it's in there, the more, I don't even know why, I can't tell you why, but you know, it's so kind of an interesting. Letting it cool naturally or like continuing to add heat to it, but just less heat. Yeah, well, like, so my kiln is pretty, it's pretty insulated and it's, an, um, and it's the, the, the heavy duty fire brick holds the heat. And, it, and they cool down really, really slow just because, you know, it's like two days later I can open my kiln before it's cool enough to open. Um, so it's, yeah, it kind of naturally cools uh, slowly because it drifts what the material is made of. But um, And then these these pieces have a lot of gray, which is a lot of carbon trapping. So when you, when you shut off the oxygen going into the kiln, there's going to be a lot of carbon buildup and you can kind of, you can get that um, on your pieces too. Although I think I know how to do that, but I thought, you know, I've done firings where I'm like, oh, these are going to be nice. I'll get some nice grays, open the kiln. Yeah. So who knows? But. And, and then carpet by like clustering them closer. Could, well, it's mostly just, I think from the atmosphere, there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere because there's no oxygen. Mm -hmm. and, the, and that's being like, uh, I guess that goes into the, I don't know. It just stays on the surface of the pot or in in the in the glaze. I mean, I, yeah. I guess that's kind of like making charcoal. It's like you make charcoal by just closing it off, and then it just it oh, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's black because you black. think of soot and you think of that yeah. black. Oh, huh. yeah. Amazing. I mean, there's there's so much I still don't know about this process. I've I've done seven firings. I'm still learning and trying to figure out what's going on and and you know, and maybe, maybe 10 years down the road, I'll find, kind of have it figured out. Um, but the flashing can be so beautiful on that, this bowl, that's a stoneware bowl and different clays will look different, um, which is, but that's kind of fun too. But I just love the, the irregular a, uh, aspect of it and the, um, the varied surfaces are really exciting to me. Um, these pieces have a slip on them and you can, you can see that buildup on the picture of the glaze. And these had had like mugs or pieces very close together, like the handle of the mug kind of resisted here. Um, so loading can be really crucial in the decorative process. Um, and it takes takes a lot of thought. It takes me a long time to load my kiln. I have like a hundred plus pieces roughly in the kiln. Um, so just kind of a brain. The glaze coats the interior of the cups. The interior, I, I pour, I use a glaze on the inter, inside. I pour a glaze in um, and I glaze the inside and I let the soda glaze the outside. Yeah. Um, these pieces have some uh, uh, terra sigillata, a, a very fine clay slip um, on those. Yeah. Yeah, I just love how you can see the movement of the flame and um, I like the earthiness and the organic nature of them. Let's see what else we got. These two pieces were actually a, a more of a, a whiter porcelain clay body um, and they had some beautiful flashing on those pieces and those corners got really highlighted. They're squared off. And that yellow and green is just from the fire? That's a, that's a slip I put on. I think that's a titanium slip on that one. There's some beautiful greens in it. There's, another one. There's that mug up close. You can see that gray carbon trapping as, and as well as the other, that little tea bowl had a, a lot of iridescence on it too. And I'm still trying to figure that out still. I, uh, mm, I don't know if it's the crash cooling that does it, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, um, are you trying a lot of different clay bodies right now, or are you kind of honing it in this certain? I'm kind of honing it. I've tried three. I've got to, I tried a stoneware, and then I have this Helmer porcelain, and then a, a very fine, uh, a, a whiter porcelain. And um, yeah, so I'm, I think I'm going to get rid of the stoneware, and I, I'm leaning towards more of the whiter porcelain. It's mm -hmm. It's got some, it's very subtle. I'm really liking it. Yeah, it's kind of quiet. It's quieter, um, but who knows? You know, I, I usually pick one clay body and just use that. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'll jump back and forth. 
Let's see. Oh, no. And then the bot. These are. I just wanted to have a couple examples of the bottoms because they're they're almost more interesting. Uh, um, you can really see the direction of the soda coming in and moving through. Um, maybe because there's just such a narrow space under the pieces that that attracts the vapors. I really. I don't know, but I just love the bottoms. Um, yeah. You can also fire pieces on their side, which is cool. And you can use those wads on the, you know, to place your, your piece on the side and you can use those wads decoratively, like something like that. Um, so that's kind of fun too. And you can also like, you know, stack things lid to lid or um, to kind of play with the decorative aspects of the wadding. And you can, you can use different materials. Some people don't like the white uh, wadding marks. They try and get them to be a little more natural, organic, but, I don't know. I, I kind of I like them interesting, but when you said the titanium slip, is that the white? The ti titanium tit excuse me, titanium goes um yellow. The mystery, I don't know. Yeah. Like you most of the slips I've been using are like yeah. Um are like a like a um titanium, zirconium, those kind of materials. Um, yeah, and they just produce these amazing colors. It's really cool. I mean, typically in my, my previous work, I was using stains, um, commercial stains. Um, and it's really kind of interesting to get into just using like the minerals and the, and the, you know, the zirconium and the titanium and, um, it's, yeah, it's kind of fun. Kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I think that's my last slide, but, um, Something else to mention is the transition and it's been interesting transitioning to totally different body of work, um, starting over almost, feeling a little bit uneasy, a little like, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, it's been just been an interesting challenge to just change up what you know, um, like jumping off a cliff. Um, and then people don't really know me with this work. They kind of know my other work because I've been doing that for a long time. So it's kind of interesting to, where's your other work? Um, you know, and then I'm like, yeah, but this. And so I get, you know, when you come to my studio, I can, you know, I can show you my kiln. I can show you um, how exciting it is for me. And um, yeah, it's interesting because it's a whole different palette. It's a whole different feel, um, but it's, yeah, got to do it, right? <laughs> yeah so that's i think that's all i got for you guys um what else yeah curious about any sort of like unexpected mishaps that have happened and i mean it looks like the flames are like <laughs> in your face <laughs> yeah. it looks it, look, it looks closer than i am oh, actually yeah. but you really have to be you do have to be really mindful and aware. And I, I like to have Joe around or somebody when I'm doing, when I'm spraying, because yeah. you have to like, right? yeah. we're not, I'm not telling them that we're doing this at all. Um, you know, you have to really like, okay, I'm pulling out the peep and I'm placing it here. And, you know, and you gotta, you really have to be, cause you could really get burned, you know? And I've had clothing on with metal rivets that have gotten so hot that I'm like, I think I'm just gonna wear sweatpants and no, no metal, but um, so, it, you know, I'm really uh, conscious of having the whole place clear and, you know, clean and because it's, it's, yeah. And it's easy to get nervous of doing it. Like my first firing, I was really, really nervous and timid. I was just like, oh my God, you know, um, I'm getting a little more used to it. I'm not going to burn the place down. Um, yeah, but it is pretty hot and it's, you know, some people don't spray into the kiln. Um, you need to have a brass tip on your sprayer. Uh, and I've, I, I usually pop the end off every firing. It just because of the heat and the pressure. Um, and I actually melted the end of the brass tip last time. It just melted onto my uh, little peep. Um, some people make uh, burritos of like of dry soda ash mixed with a couple other ingredients, and they just like throw them into the firebox, mm -hmm. and they land in the firebox, and then it vaporizes. Does mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, but it just, you know, so you don't have to deal with the spraying because it's pretty intense and hot and, you know, I'm still kind of, kind of refining that, um, that way of introducing it. But one, one thing about dropping in burritos is your firebox gets very eaten up. It's very highly corrosive. 
which is another thing with these kilns is eventually you have to rebuild them that corrodes all the brick. And once you fire with soda and or salt, similar material, um, it coats your kiln. So it's like a glaze in there. Um, and it's always gonna vaporize. It's always gonna affect your, your work. So you're pretty much are dedicating yourself to that way of firing. Yeah. That you'll convert to salt once uh, you have the rebuild. <laughs> well, one of the things that I did this last firing is I threw some wood in at the end um, to help with reduction because it's burning, it's taking the oxygen out of the kiln. Mm -hmm. It can affect the surfaces. And, the, and, the, and I used driftwood, which is salt, obviously. Um, and I think that's why I got some of the really textured surfaces on some of them because salt firings are much more like orange peel surfaces. They're very textured. Soda gets you is a little smoother. Um, so that was kind of a fun little, you know, discovery was using the driftwood and seeing what, what that can do. But but so no big mishaps at this point. But you know, and the nice thing too, you can refire um in these kilns. Like if you have a piece that didn't get a lot of soda or you don't like it, you can throw it in again and there'll be more, it'll get more effects from the more soda, more more time in the kiln maybe I don't know but you can get some beautiful refires that are just you know yeah which is kind of nice because typically once you fire your pieces you can't usually refire them in like an electric kiln you know you can't add more glaze to them because they're vitrified and they don't won't absorb anything but so it's kind of what's like your production flow like as far as like your do you have to like plan your whole kind of year out as far as sales and like how many firings do you well it, it's looking year? like with this kiln i do um it's been like every three months uh -huh. it'd be nice to get it down a little more but um it would be nice to be able to fire more the other factors firing in the summer is becoming kind of a question mark for me with the heat the dry um and just the intensity heat with the kiln, I'm a little nervous about, you know, about that. But um, so what I, you know, I just make enough pots, a cycle of pots, two months, six, eight weeks, something like that, fire the kiln and then start again. And I'm trying to balance out different size forms, different shapes, you know, thinking about how you're stacking and loading the kiln. And so it's very, very different from considerations than I had before. It's, it's all, it's all new. Yeah, such a large volume of the, of the kiln. It is. And I thought I was building a smallish kiln. Yeah. I thought I was like, I, I thought, oh, it's just a nice size studio kiln. But, you know, 100 and, 120 pots is, I don't know. It's a lot for me. You know, I'm not a big, I'm not a big, I'm not a big production, like sit down and throw all day kind of a, you know, maker. But um, so, yeah, it takes some time to. Yeah, I can't just like whip up some pots and throw it in my electric kiln and we're done, you know, which I'm really appreciating that now that I'm not doing that as much, but yeah, I know. Do you have, oh. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, I was noticing how soft the bottoms oh. and the underside of the pieces are how do you achieve that or is that just well I try and smooth them pretty much w when I make them um once things come out of the kiln I also smooth I have these diamond sanding pads that I use so I sand everything after it comes out um one of the things that soda will do is if you spray heavy it'll start it can drip off the pots and then you have all these drips that you have to really sand like with a dremel um, there's a nice balance between a, between a nice, healthy, you know, level of soda on the pots and too much. So I do sand everything, you know, so it doesn't scratch up the surfaces they sit on, you know, but the clay is, is a little finer texture too. So that helps too, like a porcelain clay is fine textured. So a little easier to smooth that. You don't have that thick sand, that groggy sand in there. So, yeah. Hey, I have one more. Yes. Um, I think I know what slip is, but I'm not quite sure. Is it just like a watered down clay? Pretty much, it's like a it's like a clay with maybe some other things added to it for the textures that you want. And sometimes there's oxides in it for color, or yeah, yeah. So it's ba basically just a watery clay, okay. yeah. And then and then Terra sigillata, which I talked about, is a very um, you you settle out clay. In, into different particle sizes by letting it sit overnight. You mix it with like sodium silicate um, and you have levels of different particle size and you sieve off the middle 
section and it's very fine, fine clay. And it's really cool. It's really smooth. And it's 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 typically used in low fire work because you can burnish it and it'll maintain that shine like a glaze. Um, but it's still really, really cool to work with at higher temperatures. You know, you have some beautiful colors and just the texture of it is really fun. But, yeah. I was going to ask what your daily work schedule is. Like, do you start at a set time every day or do you say I'm going to do four hours today or how? Yeah, I try, I try to, um, you know, when I had my kids and they were in school, I would like, that was my work day, you know, they, they go to school and I would work. Um, and now, and I, and you know, my studio's at my home, I have a showroom and I'm open. So I definitely work during my open hours. Um, so I do try, you know, I've always kind of treated it as like a job, you know, that was my way of being disciplined about it. Cause you know, when you work at home, you can easily do the laundry and make another cup of coffee. I think I'll clean instead. I don't know how to work this problem out in the studio. I'll go do this, but so yeah, I do, I do, you know, keep a set schedule for sure helps with production you know yeah anybody else thank you wow. thanks for listening <laughs> and i also have those pieces over there if you want to check them out some of them are in, are, are in the slides but you got to feel them and you know this is so interesting. Thank you so Thanks much. Wow. Yeah, the process is really amazing. It's just, and I just love, like, I have a mug of yours from the soda part, and it's, I love just, like, the whole piece. It's just, like, the bottom, and it's, like, yeah. everything. It's yeah. just, like, it's so oh, wonderful. It's, it's, it's like, such a beautiful object. It's different, isn't it? Yeah. And it's just, it's Oh, really fun. Yeah. Well, thank you, Zoomers, yeah. for joining us. We're gonna stop this share and we are going to stop the recording. And this would be available on YouTube at some point. So take care and have a great night. Very peachy. Orange, not like a